My name is Rob Stewart. I'm a professor of geophysics at the University of Houston. And in this uh, first GWB project that's located in the United States, we've put together some work that we're calling Dignity in Depth, an effort to help restore African-American cemeteries, many of which have fallen into disrepair and really have a great need for a lot of attention. Welcome to SDG's Seismic Sound Off, conversations addressing the challenges of energy, water, and climate. I'm your host, Andrew Gary. This episode explores the first Geoscientists Without Borders project in the United States. I first speak with the project lead, Rob Stewart, about using the power of geophysical techniques to uncover and restore forgotten African American cemeteries in Houston, Texas. After speaking with Rob, I speak with SCG Executive Director Jim White on how this project will play a special role at IMAGE 2024. This episode will address the educational benefits of involving students in such projects, as well as the personal satisfaction derived from aiding in these culturally significant endeavors. As we navigate the complexities of modern urban development and the preservation of sacred sites, this episode illuminates the critical role of geophysicists and humanitarian efforts the importance of community engagement, and the profound connections we forge with our history. Please check out the show notes for the links referenced in this conversation. Up first, my conversation with Rob Stewart. Starting kind of a step back for people that may not be familiar, what is Geoscientists Without Borders or GWB? And GWB is a, is a fabulous application of our science and technology to social and humanitarian needs. So GWB really supports the humanitarian application of our great science of geophysics. So one of the things in, in reading about this project was that several Houston community groups where, where you're based and this project is based kind of proactively sought help from the geophysical community for helping with, with tracking these African-American cemeteries that had gone under disrepair. How did this conversation first start and when did you get involved in, in these conversations? Well, as you know, the, uh, the SEG has been great in supporting our field camps and, um, and student work. And we've been involved with shallow geophysics like many other groups. So we have these technologies that are, that are useful for shallow investigations. And on that basis, we've been approached over the years by various law enforcement agencies and uh, archaeologists, as well as cultural groups, to help them in the search for anything in the near subsurface. So uh, over the last several years, there's a uh, there are many hundreds and hundreds, of course, of cemeteries, tens of thousands across the country. As groups uh, become more interested in their past and um, respecting their history and trying to reconstruct their histories, they've approached us. So a number of cemetery groups and uh, community associations have approached us to help them try to find unmarked burials in their areas, many of which were completely in states of disrepair, overgrown, and fallen headstones and incomplete markers. and So we've been approached a number of times by cemetery groups, and we tried to, uh, with a few of them, such as the Conroe Community Association, another African-American cemetery, who have a very big effort on their own, but they wanted to apply uh, higher technologies to help them find unmarked burials. So we helped with them. And then um, Evergreen, the Evergreen Negro Cemetery Group and Project Respect approached us too. And this gets into a very uh, complicated urban infrastructural, cultural, <laughs> complicated situation where you've got very sacred burial sites in the middle of rapidly growing cities that are attempting to improve public transit and, and all kinds of things like that. And so there's a, there's a, a crash, a clash, uh, an intersection of interests. And with cemeteries, of course, of course there's a great quotation um, attributed to Benjamin Franklin, show me your cemeteries and I will show you what kind of people you have. And how that's interpreted is that that the respect and honor that we give to our predecessors really indicates what kind of character we have. 
and so again, as as groups develop and become more respectful of their own history and then other people's respect it, then you want to uh, document, categorize, complete, and then refurbish this, these historical elements. How do the geo these geophysical techniques help? these associations find these unmarked burials and help them restore these cemetery plots? Well, as you can imagine, especially in, um, in untended or uh, areas of disrepair, you can't really see anything on the surface. Uh, there are a lot of fascinating ways that people try to, uh, in a sense, reunite families, locate burials. So all the way from uh, different Plant species, of course, you uh, people would honor the burial with bringing in flowers or shrubs. On the one hand, you're looking for what plant doesn't belong here in a native sense. So there are many techniques on the surface, but they don't always work. And of course, that doesn't really prove anything. So we're trying to give more attributes. In other words, there are cultural indicators. There might be shells, there might be pottery, there might be something in the surface that says, we think that there could be a burial here. So when you can't find it from the surface, and you know that there are hundreds or thousands of burials in an area, then what else can you do? The next, the next thing, of course, is to use our techniques for bumps on the surface, different soils, uh, ground penetrating radar to see anomalies, magnetics, metal detectors. So we'll then start to throw everything that we can in our toolkit to find anomalies. Then you start to, to probe and see if there's something uh, unusual in, the, in, in a penetration test. And then you might start shallow excavations. But once again, there are lots of laws and sensitivities and spiritual beliefs that govern uh, disinterments. And so that, that's something that comes well down the road and we want to do everything we can before you get to that stage. What do you hope training the next generation of geophysicists in these types of techniques will do to further humanitarian work in something like a GWB project? First, we want to show the, the broad applicability of geophysics and geophysical methods. So we uh, were involved in looking for energy, of course, uh, an economic pursuit, resources, economic pursuits, but also with... Uh, natural disasters and hazards, what can we do there? And as well as archeology span in these social pursuits. So we're trying to expose the students, first of all, to good scientific thinking. How do I design a survey? What's the target? How big is it? What are the target's characteristics? And then what technologies do we have to approach the search? And then actual hands-on use of these methods, that's, that's a really key part of, we believe, student education. Um, manipulating the tools themselves, and then uh, having, a, having a meaningful place to do that. So in the field, in, in the mountains, or in, in wherever we are. But uh, the students get excited, too. The, the, this Evergreen Negro Cemetery is only a couple miles from our University of Houston campus. It's very much in our backyard. The history is very important, and it's a, a very immediate practical need are there burials here because there's infrastructure that's, uh, that's proposed to be put in here? So all the way from the spiritual aspects uh, to the social aspects, to the outreach aspects, the student aspects, as well as a very practical problem of location. So that it's a big mix of all of those. Yeah, it's really a great combination of all the ways geophysics can help <laughs> all these things coming together. And, and, you know, you mentioned throughout this conversation, you know, the spiritual need of this, the historical significance of these cemeteries and the work, uh, as well as just kind of furthering the development of Houston in general as a city. What does it mean for you to personally lead this type of project where all these things are coming together? Well, I think there's a great warmth in addressing uh, a social and a human need directly. So I find it heartwarming and satisfying to deal directly with people who have, who have their ancestors right there who have uh, family members. We've had people come in from California and around the country who, uh, who grew up in the area and who had some of their ancestors buried there and you're chatting with them and how important it is to them. And that, that importance, that depth of importance to them just is heartwarming and spiritually satisfying to us. So that, that's a big part of it. And then when, when other people are interested, students say, gee, you know, that's important. 
And then we learn things. I, uh, in some of the cemeteries, of course, there's uh, stories in the stones. Chains on a headstone means that that person was a former slave. The Son of the Masonic symbolism says that that person was involved in Freemasonry. So there are these fabulous histories and understandings. On a personal level, it's very important that we establish our connections and our roots, significance. And then technically, too, we're, we're explorationists. So this might seem kind of a little bit odd, but whenever we find anything that we're trying to find and we can help with however that's meant to help, it's satisfied to us. So when we find all the attributes of a burial and in Conroe, when we find all these attributes, they will mark them. They have been putting markers on uh, the anomalies that we find. And so we, we're very satisfied to have helped them, in a sense, reunite the families as well as uh, commemorate and honor those, those who passed. Do you feel like there's a question that somebody should be asking around using geophysics in a humanitarian method? Yeah, you know, I, think, I think you're right. The, um, because it's technology, you kind of think that you've got um, a cold, sterile technology on the one hand, and maybe the, the deepest emotional and psychological attachments to those past on the other hand, you think, how do you mate those? How do you put those together? And whenever we go into cemetery, when I personally go to the cemeteries, I have a little moment where I reflect on myself that what we're doing and the instruments that we've got to do it, how they're all uh, associated and in kind of a, a friendly, supportive way to help with the final, the final goals, which are honorable. And so these are our, our, our instruments. We're going to use our technology. Uh, in, a, in a sense, it's like the uh, the calling of a geophysicist where in some parts of the world, there's a ring ceremony and you vow to do the best you can with the tools and your working hands to make the world a better and more complete place. I think our very technical, quantitative, objective tools can be used in this actually interpretive way too, because they don't tell us exactly everything. So there's that subjective kind of more qualitative artistic interpretation of our pictures too. And I think uh, some of the other great folks, Paul Bowman and Harry Joel and others who are working in this area are excellent scientists, but they've got a very good idea of what we can do and what we can't do. And it's so critical. Also, as another aspect to say, you know, we actually can't do that here. We'll give you some interpretations, but this isn't proof. So we have to be a bit careful too on the limitations of our tools. Do you think there's a place within the education of a geophysicist? You're at the University of Houston for like a standard course where you expose future geophysicists in ways like this to use these techniques and tools and in, in other maybe non-economic methods? Yeah, so I think in the, in the curriculum, we of course want to give all the foundational elements, but, but we're all human and we like to be motivated. And certainly um, a career in, in oil and gas is, an, is a noble pursuit, but that's not going to be for everybody. And so we want to expose people to this idea that there are resource applications, there are planetary applications, there are hazard applications, there are archaeological applications, there are forensic applications. So that um, there's, a, there's a huge flowering of, of places where we could garden. So yes, I think it's really important, even with any of the most advanced theory to say, say there's a reason why you're doing this triple integral. And one of the reasons is it's a beautiful thing in general, but on the other hand, we've got very important applications to keep the, everything from keeping the lights on to having honorable uh, parting ceremonies and, and places. So, yeah, I think it's really motivational. We find with students that they're all individuals, as you know, and they all have slightly different or very different uh, interests. Some are interested more socially, some are interested more economically, but also a uh, I think it's important, as we were saying, to have hands-on. And when there's a very important cultural and community site that's only a few miles away, where you can do important work for the community, then that really is an opportunity to ply your trade as, as well as do something important. Before, before the final question, is there anything I should have asked you that I did not? Well, I think the, uh, the support GWB is really key 
for uh, these purposes because there isn't that much, frankly, support funding around for for the social application of our of our technical tools. So, supporting groups like GWB is really key to have these highly visible. A lot of this work is is in the newspapers. It's on television. It's extremely important to communities. One thing that made me uh, very pleased was we were working in, in the cemetery and there were some young guys in a truck that came by and they kind of punched their fists in the air and said, it's about time. It's about time. Good work. These applications near, these are in a, a small case, but every individual response like that to me counts and says, you're on the right track. You're doing the right thing. So this, uh, this level of um, significance attached to not, again, not just our um, economic pursuits, but our cultural and spiritual pursuits, and how as technical people, scientists, we can actually assist in the social and the spiritual world, that's just tremendously satisfying for us. Please check out the show notes to learn how you can donate to GWB today. And now, here is my conversation with Jim White. Well, Jim, this is an exciting and new conversation we're about to have about a GWB project in the United States. Why did SEG decide to pursue a project in the U.S.? Obviously, there's more desire and more opportunity to uh, impact communities and municipalities uh, across the globe outside the U.S., and some may say that we need to continue that that trend. Part of the challenge we have within the scope of GWB, though, is, is these grants are offered through the SEG through contributions that we get through our foundation. And we're not getting as much money as I think we, we, we would hope to get. And part of the challenge is sometimes people want to actually feel and see the, the investment and where it's going. And that's difficult if you're working in an initiative across the globe, let's say in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Trying to find water or in the Far East, working through trying to predict tsunamis. It's just one of those things where I think if we can we can get something that, that they can put their arms around it, get their hands dirty, that I think we would have a better chance of getting people to con- contribute and support financially these initiatives that we want to take. So the idea was how do we create a pathway to doing something here in the U.S.? The idea was, how about we create a pathway to a GWB project within the the surroundings of Houston, I'm going to say within a two or three hour radius, so that we could create a field trip for image for our attendees and our stakeholder companies to get engaged with. And the result was we found one. And... Because of that, we're, we're, we're able to kind of move on this particular, this particular initiative, which I think is going to be very, very impactful to the community, to a, a, an, an organization. And it's going to help us, I think, it will be the catalyst to help us raise more capital and raise more investment and raise more donations into the, into the mix so that we can, we can do subsequent GWB projects well into the future. You know, it's possible at Image, a lot of people that attend this field day might be seeing geophysics applied in a way they have never considered utilizing geophysics, and and then they might start exploring the other GWB projects and what's happening. What do you hope is is the greater impact on on the applied geophysics community in learning and being a part of this project? That's a great question. I I have in my role as, as executive director, and then you mentioned, I, I do have a geoscience background. So I've spent 40 plus years in, in subsurface imaging, you know, applied geophysics. As scientists, we tend to migrate to things that we're very comfortable with. I'm comfortable with seismic imaging for oil and gas. I'm not comfortable with near surface applied geophysics for imaging in the subsurface, like ground penetrating radar or electromagnetics. And so we tend to shy away from those types of applications within the scope of applied geophysics. So I've been forced into exposing myself to these other forms of applied geophysics. And obviously I'm a better scientist because of it. 
And so that was a great question because I think one of the things we'll do is we'll expose those individuals that haven't necessarily seen that type of application to subsurface geophysics. And hopefully they'll come away better informed, better educated, better aware of how there are multiple ways that we can use applied geophysics, not just for one particular area that maybe they were comfortable with. What challenge would you like to leave the listener from this conversation? Well, hopefully if you're in a position of opportunity where you can help support this financial, that's one challenge, right? Secondly, help get the word out. Again, as scientists, we are constantly driven to try to find new and innovative ways to approach a particular challenge or a particular problem solving uh, issue. And this is a problem that we have right now. Raising money and getting support for GWB is critically important for us right now. And things have changed. Times have changed. Even though we've come out of the pandemic and, and things are getting better from a, a resource perspective, it just seems like we don't have a lot of momentum with individuals that want to give and support this, even though it checks all the boxes of how impactful it can be for communities, individuals. It checks so many boxes. And you would scratch, I scratch my head as to why we're not getting as much support as we probably should, or as much as I think we should. And I think that's the intent of this initiative is to try to bring that, that scope to the surface so that people can see what we're doing. And again, understand that we, we need their help. Because remember, we want to be impactful. I use that word a lot in this, in this discussion, but that's, that's critically important. We want to be impactful. Well, I, I'm sure if you follow SEG's website and, and SEG on social media, you will know when you could register for the field camp and we'll do our best on the podcast to highlight when it, it is going out to start registering for that. So, Jim, I appreciate your time on this very important and momentous project for GWB and look forward to seeing where it goes. Uh, I appreciate having me on, Andrew, and I'm, I'm, I look forward to uh, bigger and better things for GWB going forward. Thank you for listening to this episode of Seismic Sound Off. SEG creates these episodes to celebrate and inspire the geophysicists of today and tomorrow. Please follow this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts to be the first to hear new episodes. You can also subscribe to the podcast now on YouTube. If you have episode ideas or feedback for the show or want to sponsor future episodes, email the show at podcast at scg.org. Andrew Gary of Treasurement hosted, edited, and produced this episode. The SEG podcast team comprises Jennifer Cobb, Kathy Gamble, and Ali McGinnis. The podcast will return on May 16th for a new season. Until then, this is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.